Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Douglas from Acquia, and I'm here today to talk to you about taking inventory of Drupal products. And it was originally titled App Stores, but I'd like to redact the title of my session and make it Marketplaces. It's part of the um, shift in concepts that I'd like to convey today. So it's been quite a week if I may say so, in terms of announcements and press releases and blog posts. I don't know if everybody's been following along closely, but uh, here are some of the titles we've seen recently. So Subhub launches world's first Drupal-powered app store. Certainly uh, written to raise a couple eyebrows and catch people's attention, which it did. Acquia unveils apps market for Drupal. The open app standard, better usability, Drupal-wide. Open app standard. Now, isn't that an interesting concept? So a lot's happened in the, uh, in the past couple weeks, but actually things got started quite a while ago in terms of thinking about marketplaces, app stores, and whatnot. So before we get into um, what all of those announcements mean and uh, what it means to have an open apps standard. And before I invite uh, some guests to uh, share the stage with me from um, Phase 2 and Subhub and from Acquia to explain some of these press releases and announcements, I want to go through a little bit of history. Uh, probably most of you saw some or all of it, but just to give the rest of the whole conversation a little bit of context around what we're talking about when we're talking marketplaces, why some of that might be important, and how that might fit into your lives on a day-to-day -day basis as Drupal developers, business owners, Drupal users, et cetera. So um, last year at some point, I had a conversation, or a topic uh, that I presented in Brussels at uh, the Dev Days, and I, I, I called it announcing the Drupal App Store. And I used the um, hashtag Drupal App Store. And what I, what I learned was that uh, that was a topic that a lot of people were quite interested in. In fact, ha several of them had somewhat strong reactions to it emotionally. Um, it's fair to say that uh, at one point it felt like it was going to unleash a worldwide uh, Viking invasion and they were going to burn down cities. Some people even went as far as to say uh, that you know the Drupal Wars were starting. So I appreciated this graphic. Unfortunately, I, I didn't trace the credit on this one, um, so it, it's uncredited, but I think it's quite a, a great graphic. So, you know, a little bit of a rabble razor, rabble rouser uh, here. It was slightly intentional that it was uh, inflammatory, but the, the whole thing started as a thought challenge for us to think as a community, what does it mean to have an app store? Is it something we want and what it would look like? And I think it actually, after people got over the emotions, that we've risen to the challenge quite splendidly. Um, and since then, I've had the chance to talk about it in many uh, contexts, many Drupal camps, a Drupal con uh, in Chicago where Jeff Walpole and I uh, shared the stage where he announced that Phase 2 was actually launching uh, an applications marketplace, an app marketplace in the context of their distributions open public and whatnot. So let me share with you some of the uh, concepts that I've developed around this as I've talked about it in many places so that when we get around at the end of the session to talking about the open apps standard and what three different companies are doing about it and with it, that you have some context how, how the thinking goes um, and, and why it, it's important. So backing way up, and if, if some of you have seen these slides before, we're going through them fairly quickly. Uh, there, there's a type of business that you can run where you essentially buy a product and you put it on your shelves, and when somebody wants it, you sell it to them for more money than you bought it. It's a very good business model. I can highly recommend it. It doesn't work very well with GPL code, where you buy the code for zero, but uh, these are called resellers. You basically take a product, you don't alter it in any way, you resell it for more than you bought it. 
There's a variation on that called a value-added reseller, where you take a product, like a bunch of cut flowers, you put them into a bouquet, put a nice little ribbon on it, maybe a w wedding card or a funeral card or a birthday card on it, and you sell that. So you've added value to the actual products. You've added aesthetic, you've packaged them in a certain way, and that's called a value-added reseller. You can apply these terms to the software industry as well. People take a product, wrap it around in services, maybe combine products together, sell that, they're value-added resellers too. And in fact, in my view, most of what people do with Drupal these days, and especially historically, because things are starting to change, is act as a value-added reseller. You take a software product, Drupal, you combine it with some things that you download from the internet, such as modules, maybe themes. You customize those. Maybe you write some more modules. You make a theme. You add value to it, and then you resell it. And the customer that you're selling to is what we typically know as a client. It's somebody who wants a website. And typically, historically, and still probably the vast majority of people's business these days is being a value-added reseller to people who want websites. This is fine. And by no means would I encourage people to stop doing that if that's what they're good at and they're making a good business. And we definitely need people to do that going on in the future. So in by no uh, means or ways am I encouraging people that that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. However, it does differ from the business model of having a product, something that's self-contained, something that you can put on the proverbial shelf. Somebody walks in and gets the product. They know the product. They know what it is. They know what they're getting. You can define it. It's uh, a whole thing in it of itself. They buy the product and they use it. Now, the, the good thing about a product like a can of Coke is that when you want a can of Coke on a hot day, nobody has to get out a bag of sugar, add water and some brown syrup, put it in a tin can and hand it to you. It's there. It's ready. It's done. You know what it is. They've provided it. And they can sell that can of Coke over and over and over again because they've got factories producing them out in the millions. So the same is true with software products. I'm, you can think of a million examples. Microsoft Word made a, a couple people really rich along the way because it was a product that you could just duplicate at zero, next to zero cost and sell over and over and over again. So software products have a very uh, valuable place in any software ecosystem. I think they have a valuable place in the ecosystem of Drupal as well, which is why I started talking about it to begin with. But my interests in the matter actually have to do with these people here. Now, I'm of the opinion that if you possess a development team like that, you can write any software you want, and it's going to be innovative and great, and uh, it's going to be the best software on Earth, right? That is the best development team ever assembled. Why wouldn't we be the most innovative product on the Earth, software-wise? Why do we have any problem with velocity? Why can't we get modules upgraded? Why can't uh, we get Drupal releases done faster? I mean, there are all these complaints about the velocity of Drupal. It is what it is. We've got good velocity. Uh, obviously, we're doing well in a lot of markets. And we're keeping up with the innovation trend, more or less. But I believe we could get more out of this development team. I think that if we managed them a little bit differently, then we'd probably have better products, uh, better Drupal, better, better modules, and that we would be more dominant, and we'd start to uh, achieve more of Dries's vision of thinking big and becoming a dominant web-building platform for the entire internet. So why are not, how are we managing this development team in ways that could be improved upon? So there are several ways. First of all, we could stop encouraging them to work on a one-hour worked, one-hour paid basis. So, how many companies do we have out there where we sell the client essentially hours, or we s sell them a fixed-priced website building project, and then we try and do it in a sh as small a number of hours as possible so we have a margin left, right? Those are basically two variations of the same thing, where we either set the hourly price in advance, or we figure out what the hourly price was once we uh, you know, get paid for the work we've done. In any case, that's not scalable. You can't work 30 hours a day. You can't work 3,000 hours a day, and uh, you usually can't sell the work product from a website building engagement more than once. The second problem with how we're managing that development team is that we're repeating the same efforts over and over and over again, okay? We're building websites that, for all purposes, 
resemble each other in a number of ways, but in very few cases do we actually take that resemblance, that commonality, abstract it, take it, make it a product, and just plug it into the next website, uh, or better yet, make it so that everybody can plug it into every website, okay? Why is there no one single what you see is what you can get editor? We haven't made it into a product. Why is there no one single does everything that you needed to image gallery? We haven't made it into a product. So we're repeating effort, and every time we do that, we do it in a slightly different way, and it's inefficient. Now, obviously, some things you need to customize for every website, and you're never going to get around that, and you're never going to find a product that makes everybody's dream website out of the box, right? Granted. But there are things that we happily standardize on, and we forget they exist, like the logon box. You might theme it, but it works the same way every time, right? Maybe it hooks into your LDAP or something, and it's got some customizations, but that's all within the product spec. 99% of all the sites we build, they've got the login box, and as long as they've applied the look and feel they want to it, they forget it exists. That's the example of a product. If we had to write the login box over and over and over again, Drupal would have never taken off. We would have you know, failed already. The next problem that I see with the way that we're managing that amazing development team is that we're distracting our great minds. So we have so many people in the Drupal community who think big already, who think of great products, who think of uh, abstracted solutions to generic problems that would help a lot of people, okay? But there are very few amongst us, actually, if we look at absolute numbers, uh, who can do what Jeff Eaton does and not only serve as clients, but then turn around and write amazing toolkit modules or uh, product modules that he con contributes to the community. Not many people have that stamina. Not many people uh, are able to actually fulfill their own expectations th of themselves t for contributing back to the community and writing all of the innovative, advancing ideas that they have in their heads. So I believe that that development team that we saw has a large untapped potential for innovation that we're not getting to because we're distracting them with client work that's repetitive and wasteful. So there's another reason that we want to focus on products in the Drupal community, in my opinion. Oops, wrong direction. And that is that if you have a great product in an ecosystem, it boosts the whole ecosystem, okay? How many people buy Apple products because the hardware is so great? It's a great product. So the computer that I'm running, I just love the hardware. How many people buy Apple products because the software is great, right? And then how many people move on to other products because in, a, in the Apple ecosystem because they had this great experience with one product, you know, iPad users who then moved to Mac OS X, iPhone users who do the same, people who choose iPhone over Android because they've already got a Mac uh, laptop. There are lots of examples of Apple products because of the greatness of one product boosting the sales for other products. This could be a great thing for Drupal, but we are still sadly lacking um, great Drupal products in a lot of areas. Now it's starting to change, and there are a number of companies, um, several of which are going to share the stage with me in a moment, who are actually making great products, and I think that we're going to get a lot of the effects that I just mentioned and hope for here. So there are other dangers, though. If you don't make great products in your ecosystem, then you uh, risk losing out, okay? So uh, I have an anecdotal story to tell you. There was a company that I've been involved with as an advisor for the past couple of years, and that company has always had a split focus on both uh, web services and development for WordPress and web services and development for Drupal. And when I started advising them, it coincided with a shift in their focus towards Drupal, and they uh, then went and released uh, a, a community module which provided a great service to Drupal, and that was a freemium model that was supposed to draw people to their web services. Didn't work out the way they wanted to, and they started looking at other business models. They thought, well, you know, one of the problems is we can't really find enough money to invest in the further development of our, our GPL module. And if we could only find a way to like, actually pay the developers to work on it more, it could become greater and then more people would use it and more of those people would want to use our web services. But the web services generation alone wasn't paying for the development of the module. So they, they posed the hypothetical question on their blog 
what if we um, char started charging everybody, you know, 20 bucks or so for the download of this, and you, we use that money for funding the development of it, and they basically got their heads cut off by the Drupal community. <laughs> I mean, gone, right? It was, it was a pretty sharp reaction. That's not the way Drupal does things. The community won't stand for it. It's selfish. It's not the way we do things. And so they said, well, okay, we'll do it for WordPress, and they did. They did it for WordPress. The developers thanked them because then they could say to their clients, this is a supported module by a actual professional development company and came with a support license and support forums and an actual business model and the, the price wasn't so big that in a $5,000 site build it was going to make any significant difference. And all of a sudden this company started had, having tens and then later hundreds of thousands of, of, of dollars of sales of this WordPress code, which is basically just like a Drupal module based on GPL, to invest in WordPress development. Guess what? We lost out. Okay, this is an area where Drupal could actually use a lot of investment right now. It's one of the hot topics for us uh, in, in in what Drupal needs to grow into. It's one of the initiatives for Drupal 8, and that's hundreds of thousands of investment dollars that could have been ours. So that's what this slide is about. It's about not losing out in finding sustainable development models so that we can continue to invest in Drupal development. So we're talking about selling stuff. Let's talk a little bit about what is a saleable asset for Drupal. Okay, so we identified uh, a couple things when, when and Karen and I and the team were brainstorming this. So you can basically sell usability. If you can sell any sort of convenience to the customer that overcomes a pain point in Drupal. We saw it in Dries' slide, slides in the keynote that um, people want Drupal to be easier to use. If you can sell something, to them that simplifies the website building process, if you can give them something, then you can charge them for it, essentially, is what I'm saying. It, if you can solve any pain point in Drupal, then you can actually turn that into a product that can be for sale. You can take that money. You can hire more developers. You can make Drupal better. How do you do that? Well, distros are a great example of doing that. How likely is a government agency going to be to use Drupal if you tell them that they have to go find the right modules, find out how to configure them, theme their site to look appropriate for a government agency? I mean, this could be an expensive build, right? It costs a lot of money. Maybe they won't want to do that. How likely are they going to be if you can say, look, there's open public. It was built for your use case. It already has a look and feel that's appropriate for government, and it's got some uh, targeted features that solve some of the actual problems that you're trying to solve around open data and uh, profiles and directories of people, uh, ways to collect ideation and ideas from constituents. You've sold them already. If you tell them you can do that, but you have to put them together in modules, no way. So there's convenience. Okay, that's another part of it. If I tell you you can build any slideshow you want with Drupal if you get views and you structure your data the right way and you get the right views plugins and you theme them the right way so that they sh shift at the right, wrong t right time, then you know, some of the developers in the room will be like, oh, that sounds like a nice challenge for a weekend. The rest of the people who are just trying to get a slideshow on their website are going to be like, no way. But if you can give them a, a downloadable app that they can just install and it does everything you need, configured the right way, themed the right way, works out of the box, that's convenience. And then there's a whole range of stuff that you can sell around full service. Okay, this includes hosting, this includes consulting, so there are lots of things you can sell to people that you can then use that money to pay your bills, invest back into Drupal, hire more developers around um, web services. Uh, the um, Malum is a great example of that. As well as beauty. Nobody balks these days at the idea of selling a theme. There are dozens and dozens of stores on the web selling themes for all major CMSs, including Drupal, and they're making good business. So much business that a lot of the Joomla theme shops are now moving into Drupal's space, trying to replicate the successful business that they had for Joomla for Drupal. Think back to the slide of the two guys running the race and uh, one of them losing the race. If Joomla has a bunch of great professional themes available and Drupal doesn't, that's going to be one of the differentiators for a lot of people who are just looking to get a nice looking site up. So it's important to us that these shops actually come in and provide professional looking themes. And we've got a number of shops doing that. And finally, one of the things that you can sell to 
to make people's lives easier about Drupal is knowledge. We've had that for a long time. We've had the Lullabots going and doing trainings. Acquia's got a training program. But what if you could deliver that knowledge right into their website experience, right where they need it, when they need it, right? Wouldn't you need a delivery mechanism for that? Wouldn't you want a billing mechanism to be able to pay people who had paid content? Because after all, you do want to pay people for your training content so that it's really good. Nobody produces five-hour training videos at the best detail, at the best resolution, at the best quality with a lot of preparation for free. Some people do, but not on the topic you want, when you need it, in the place you need it. So by paying people to provide the services that we seek and need, we actually enable them to give them to us. OK, so that's the context. Now we're going to move into the bit of the presentation where I start talking about what's actually going on. One of the things that's going on, and if you've watched the press releases, if you watched Acquia's website, um, if you watch Twitter around the matter, uh, you'd know that Acquia has built an API for their Acquia network, which is now going to allow people to plug into it and provide a number of services. Some of them would be apps, if you will. Uh, and we've done this. We've been building it for about a year, um, and we plan to. We've now got some beta um, services that are available to our customers now. And by Q4, we want to make it generally available public. And I'm looking at Chris Brookins to make sure I'm not saying anything wrong. He'll start shaking his head if I do. So what would that provide? So if you look at the if you look at the graph I've got here, the Acquia network consists of uh, our support, our cloud services, and then third-party cloud services. You've heard of some of them before, like uh, Malum, um, Mobify, New Relic. We've been advertising that we have those for a long time, and those integrations were basically one-off efforts. You know, we'd work with the partner to figure out how to get their services into our network. But what we've been able to do then from that experience is generalize that. And we know we want analytics and commerce, social media, CRM, video, and whatever great ideas you're coming up with now in the, or in the future to offer. We want to be able to plug those in in a scalable way um, and, and let you know, people offer these to our customer base. So the, 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 pro the services that we provide in an Acquia network marketplace include things like listing your product the ability to charge money for your product and pass it on to you, the ability for you to uh, interact with the customer in some way, the things that you'd expect in a marketplace. So some of the, um, the new service that we have, um, we have a, a tool called Blitz, which is a, a load, ses load testing tool. Uh, and this is one of the beta versions or the, 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 the early adopter versions of the Acquia Network API that's going to be uh, available later. So that's a great tool that lets you set, set up a load testing service for your website. And they've got a really great component that I really like about it. They let, there's a social component to the load tests. And I've been missing this in Drupal for a long time. If you, if you have 100 people who load test their Drupal website and they can compare results, that would be really interesting. Like, why is your site so much faster than mine? Why is your site so much slower than mine? Are they really that different? And they provide this. That's going to be really great. And um, the, uh, the other one that's not listed here is um, uh, Drupalize Me. That's a service, that's a website that exists built by the Lullabots that's the home to their training materials. It's a sus subscription-based service where you pay money to get access to their great training materials. And starting immediately or in the near future, all of that material is going to be available to customers of the Acquia network. So the important part of that is that when we talk about a marketplace, we've already hit two really divergent use cases. One is a web service that interacts with your website directly. And another one is a web service that provides training materials to the end customers. So there, there are lots of different ways that a marketplace can be used. So Acquia's built that. Uh, we've been building it for about a year, and it's now going live. We've announced it. It turns out that there are a couple other companies that are working on similar things. And I'd, I'd like to actually um, invite them to the stage now. So we, we're going to bring up Karen Borchert from Phase 2 Technology, um, Evan Rudowski from Subhub, and Moshe Weitzman from Acquia. 
And I'm inviting them to the stage in the context of an initiative that has grown out of the uh, realization that a lot of what a marketplace does and a lot of what the marketplace has is, is like really similar from one instance to another. And it also comes from the realization that if you're going to build a marketplace, you have a great incentive to make it the biggest marketplace possible. Okay? When you're a vendor of a service or of a good, uh, then you want to be able to sell it to the greatest number of people possible. So it's not conceivable in Drupal, at least at the moment, that there's going to be one dominant marketplace like there is for Apple. I'm not even sure we'd want that. However, we do see marketplaces emerging. So Subhub announced uh, recently that they have an app store, and Phase 2 announced in Chicago that they have an app store. And I can, I've, I've heard other people talking about building similar things. And in, in a way, Drupal.org itself is an app store or a marketplace. So the realization that there um, was the danger of duplicating effort in five different uh, permutations, uh, that came, the idea prompted this group to come together and we're happy as a group to announce that there is now a, a draft document about an open app standard that's been worked on and now published on groups.drupal.org. The URL is at the bottom of the page. So the, the kind of the history of that, um, so Subhub was actually the first out of the gate. They launched their app store all the way back in November of 2010 and they've got customers who are using that and service providers using that. Phase two back in Chicago um, in March announced that and demonstrated that uh, Open Public was going to have an App Store component and that that would then become a central part of all of their distributions over time. And then um, this week, Acquia announced that uh, we too not only have a, a marketplace for the Acquia network, but that in the future, we'd actually like to have something like this in Drupal Gardens as well, and that we're joining the working group for the Open standard to participate in it, to you know, show what we've learned in building the Acquia network marketplace, and if possible, to adopt it for Drupal Gardens, because we want uh, the marketplace to be as big as possible and as inclusive as possible to give the people who are going to sell things in it the most incentive to be part of it, and that's very important. So I'm going to read the first bit from the open um, standard draft. And then I'm going to turn the floor over to um, Karen, Evan, and Mosh. So the goal, and then we're going to move to questions. We've still got plenty of time for that. The goal for the open app standard is to define the purpose and high-level components of an app infrastructure in Drupal and to define the technical protocols required for the creation, use, and distribution of apps in the community and the larger marketplace. And I think that's very carefully worded to encapsulate and capture a lot of the values and context that I tried to convey in the first part of the presentation. So I'm very happy then to turn it over to my colleagues. Take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. Big room. Uh, so the two of the members of the Open uh, App Standard Working Group that, that you haven't heard about yet in this session are, are Phase 2 and Subhub. Um, we've heard a lot about, about what Acquia is doing. So we'll just go through a little bit about what we're, what we're each doing. Um, phase two, we specialize in Drupal distributions um, and actually built uh, apps as a module that was a technical solution to a technical problem. Um, an open sourced um, module, we open sourced it a few weeks ago and um, built documentation for building apps, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. But um, the concept of apps itself, we really built as part of a distribution, not to launch an enormous war on app stores. Um, or the concept of app stores, but actually to solve the problem, um, a usability problem that people were having with our distributions in Drupal. Um, so that's really the, the history and like where we came from at this, towards this idea. Um, and I'm gonna uh, let Subhub kind of tell you where they came from and then we'll, we'll take a look at what the app stores look like. So Subhub um, is maybe one of the first companies to um, try to productize Drupal in the way that Robert was describing earlier, kind of the Coca-Cola model, where um, we're trying to provision thousands of websites to um, consumers, to individuals, to small companies at a very low price point, and we're trying to do that in an automated fashion um, while also giving them the flexibility and the control over what elements they incorporate into their platform. So for us, um, an app model is really critical and giving them that control, but also making it very modular and um, turnkey and 
deliverable at high volumes and at um, low transaction costs. So that's really our motivation for, for being here and participating and launching this kind of solution. And this is actually a, a slightly blurry picture of our um, app store as it looks today within our platform. And um, you can see a lot of similarities to um, app implementations on other platforms. Um, and it has many of the same kind of elements. Um, apps are organized in various ways. Um, we don't have a, a large enough quantity of apps yet to organize them by category, but that'll come. And also, um, users of those apps can rate them and, and rank them and write reviews of them. So um, over the time, the marketplace helps to determine which apps are uh, most useful and most successful. Um, and this is the App Store in, uh, this is an open public, so um, the apps that you see here, again, you know, easy to discover and find, read about, see screenshots of, vote on, up or down. Um, and then, you know, in, in this case, these are all open sourced, um, open sourced apps. The apps, the modules themselves are all, um, are all open source. Um, and the module itself, the apps module that goes into the distribution is open source as well. So it's, you know, it, again, the, the concept of apps here that we're looking at um, and the concept of an app market or console or, or store um, is really, you know, it's, it's a very similar concept with a few different implementations. So um, together, um, we and Acquia, um, these three organizations came together and said, okay, listen, you know, there's a lot of these, uh, the, the word app flying around. Let's get a conversation going in this community about what this really is and what it isn't um, and what it is intended to be and help to develop something that the community can agree on um, around the concept of apps overall and then around the concept of how those apps become something useful in the marketplace um, in the same way that themes have become useful in the marketplace and training has become useful in the marketplace as a reasonable um, answer to a, uh, to a customer need. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about what apps are um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what apps aren't. So um, we'll, we'll start with Evan. I get to do the, the positive one, what are apps? Um, basically, um, they're meant to solve a very specific problem. They're meant to contain um, a discrete bit of functionality and be very easy to add to your website without any technical skill required. Um, that's part of improving usability as well, because if you can do that, obviously um, Drupal and the sites that are, and the services that are built on top of Drupal become much more usable and user friendly. Um, at the same time, it makes it more um, usable for the developer community, um, it's a set of clear rules that enable um, a developer to come along and, and write a discrete um, solution to a problem and actually have that be um, very easily deliverable across many, many websites um, all at once. And similarly, it also makes it possible for um, companies and organizations that are not part of the Drupal community to um, build for Drupal without having to get into the deep detail of understanding Drupal, so it um, opens up Drupal to a much wider audience and much greater participation from other enterprises and other organizations that have services and products to offer, um, but need to uh, do it in a way that doesn't require them to um, figure out Drupal first. And then um, finally, and related to that point, it, it facilitates a Drupal economy. So just as Robert was saying earlier, the example of the, uh, the Drupal um, solutions provider that ended up <coughs> excuse me, going to WordPress instead because they found um, a more receptive economy that enabled them to make money. Um, we think this is something that helps Drupal as well because it creates a way for people to um, build services and charge for them and actually, um, as a result of that, facilitates innovation and um, development of new features and capabilities um, motivated a bit by a, a profit motive, which is a good thing in our opinion. And now we'll talk about what apps are. What they're not. not. Uh, so. Earlier, I, I said to these guys <laughs> in another room, um, the best way I can describe apps are convenience nuggets. Uh, apps are apps are really intended to be a usability um, concept around functionality in Drupal, um, and what they're not is intended to be um, something a, a way for someone to um, go and immediately sell their module just straight out. Um, it's not about selling a module; it's about um, providing a layer of usability, download, configure, um, find uh, it around functionality in Drupal. It could be one module or many. Um, so it's not just a way to sell, sell modules. Um, it is not a single app, Drupal app store to rule them all. Um, it's not 
a, a push for a single um, it, app store concept in Drupal that will that will take over um, the the very important part of, of Drupal that is the open source community, the most important part of Drupal. Um, and it's not a plan to commercialize Drupal or contract the open source community. Um, so again, you know, where apps are coming from, what we care about in apps, um, is the solution that it creates in creating greater usability in Drupal, um, and in what we, where we can go with that as a community. You can go to the next one. And we'll go, try to kind of scoot through these so people have time for questions. Um, oh, okay, so um, why standardize? Obviously, I mean, the reasons for standardizing are really reasonable. You don't want one person saying, you know, hey, MailChimp, come and build an app with us. It's a Drupal app, and we'll put it in our, in, we'll put it in our app store or our app market, um, and then have another company two weeks later going, hey, MailChimp, do you want to build a Drupal app? Not that kind of Drupal app, a different kind of Drupal app. Um, that's where things get really frustrating for third-party service providers. And if there's a, one thing we don't need Drupal to be anymore is frustrated for any, frustrating for anyone else. We want to make it easy. So um, interoperability between distributions, between SaaS offerings, between different organizations um, is hugely key. If somebody builds a MailChimp app that can fit on your distro and then on somebody else's, it's going to be more valuable to the community overall. Um, and then best practices. Um, there are great ways to package together functionality in a usable way, and there are not so great ways. Um, so standardizing around some best practices there um, is something that we'd really, we really think is, is a value. Um, so we'll just go really quickly through what the, what the actual standard is, entails right now. Um, and do you want me to do that? Or are you, okay. <laughs> um, so right now there's a working group. There's there's three organizations in the working group as of now, but it's not a, a you know certainly not a closed working group. Um, currently the working group is all people who are who are doing or dealing with apps in some way already. Um, the open app standard is in draft on the groups.drupal.org site for open apps for the open app standard. Um, it is a draft. It is here and ready for comment, question, discussion, um, and a forum around that. Um, and then there will be, um, alongside that, the ability to create open um, documentation for apps built on the open app standard. So um, the API, how to plan and build for them, um, and then a, a manifest specification as well. Um, so, and then the last thing we really see as an opportunity, just going back to that MailChimp e example, is that those who are participating in the open app standard can potentially go to partners together and say, you know, Hello MailChimp, we are 15 organizations who have standardized around a simple concept of usability in Drupal, and we want to build an app with you. Um, and that's that, that we think there's a lot of strength in those numbers. Um, so just, and finally, how to get involved um, is, you know, please join the discussion at, at groups.drupal.org. Um, love it or hate it, we'd love for you to, to make your opinion known. Um, bring your partners to the table and understand what they need. If what, what they need is a, a usability, um, solution and if what they need is something that's more like an app and less like a customization, maybe worth discussing building an app um, for it and then start building apps is obviously the, the last one that we would really encourage um, apps. The module is out on, on D.O and documentation is coming out around it. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Evan. So now I'm going to open the floor to audience questions. Um, you can address them to me. Um, speak nice and loudly so I hear. Uh, we'll repeat them, and we'll keep our keep our guests on stage so they can answer too. Sir. So the question is, how do apps differ from features? I'm gonna yeah, step take right this up. to our take, take this to our technical team member. You thought you wouldn't get a technical question, and you did. Oh, we're calling in the backup. Um, so, I, my name is Eric Summerfield. I'm one of the developers at Phase 2. I uh, did a lot of the work on the apps module. So part of the, when you look at specification, one of the first things you see in the best practices for making an app is uh, it be kit compliant. Uh, so there is probably an expectation that most apps will be generated as features. Um, the apps part of it is a lot more about these best practices of combining those things together and sort of finishing the vision that DevSeed started with building the features module. Um, so technically, you know, an app's a module. So like just, just like people used to ask, what's the difference between a feature and a module? 
And it's like, oh, well, it is a module, but it's a module that does this extra stuff. And an app is a feature that does this extra stuff and allows us to distribute it quickly and um, allow more tie-ins to third parties and that kind of stuff. So if, if I could then elaborate on that, you could imagine an app that would deliver paid video content into the website to give contextual help. That would be a type of an app that is module delivered. That's the technical level. But the product that's being delivered is more of a training service. So it doesn't preclude the, those types. So you had a second question. So the question, in short, is how will the commercialization of uh, these apps change the community? Well, I mean, that's really hard to predict and know. Therefore, uh, it's up to the community to be involved. And that's why we call to you to be involved in the standard. That's why it's an open standard. And we'd like to hear your opinions on that, of course. However, one thing that I do anticipate is that there will be people drawn to the community who weren't drawn to it before people who might have written functional bits that would be useful to Drupal but aren't integrated now. That's one effect that I highly welcome because I think that'll help us grow and help us be in a more attractive offering for people to use Drupal. Um, I can take a crack at that to start. And we'll let, go ahead and let Mosh. Mosh hasn't had his voice heard yet. <laughs> well, I, OK, thanks. Um, you know, from my perspective, it's a foregone conclusion that there's going to be app stores for Drupal. All right? So you have to start from there. Um, and if you agree with that premise, then you want app stores to be good for Drupal, right? And to be done responsibly. It's just like sex happens and you want people to have safe sex. So you talk about it. Um, it's a lot like that. So um, what we've done here is pretty remarkable. Um, you have cooperation between three different commercial entities in Drupal. Um, we definitely compete at different parts of Drupal, yet we decided to work together. Um, and we did it, and we made an open app standard for Drupal, and, and all of us are making an open app standard. Um, that's something that Apple didn't feel a need to do. That's something that Google didn't feel a need to do. Um, and lots of app stores never have an open app standard. and so. I think you have evidence of the Drupal community doing it in a Drupal way already. And you know, if we can keep talking about it and keep doing it in a Drupal way, then it's going to come out strong in the end. Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the front. So the question is, how would you sell software as a service products if the basic component of the products are modules? OK. So let's, let's take a little um, step backwards and, and, and look at the people on stage and what they're offering. Evan has a software as a service Drupal installation, as does Acquia, Drupal Gardens. In both cases, that's a software as a service product which the end customer will never directly uh, you know, install their modules on because it makes it impossible to offer a software as a service product when you open that up. Therefore, we need a way to get code from outside to the inside in a controlled way. So instead of giving the end customer the control to like, use FTP to move Drupal code onto Drupal Gardens, we need a way to let them to choose a product and a service from the outside that they want that's met a standard, that has a standardized delivery mechanism, and then put that in there. Now, it, it could be that um, your software is a service. So note that we're not selling Drupal Gardens through the App Store standard.
I don't, I don't, I don't think we're targeting. Go, go ahead, Evan. Uh, that's yeah. so. That, that's basically the purpose of a distribution. Um, the purpose of a distribution is to s sell a well, or the purpose of a distribution is kind of a, a pre-created type of website for a specific use. Um, a marketplace for distributions is not outside of the realm of possibility, but that's not what it's not an app, basically. <laughs> Um, what I would say is that at Subhub, um, it's kind of irrelevant to us whether or not it's based on a, a module, and we already have examples of um, third-party you know, software as a service or service providers um, in our app store, like MailChimp, for example. Um, there are others, and basically, um, in that context, the app is something that drives people to them, and then um, the customer then purchases that service from that third party, and we get a cut. So for us, you know, the, the app is really just a way of placing that third-party presence within our app store and giving the customer a chance to purchase that service and start by using a bit of that functionality within the app to begin with. So I think there are lots of ways that they can be implemented and lots of motivations for creating an app. Um, a module extension is one of them, but it could also be just um, driving people to use additional services that are offered by third parties. Thank you. Evo. So is the, the question is, do we have to have a, a software as a service environment for apps to succeed, or are there other ways? Um, if I understand the question right, um, you're asking, could we actually like app offer downloadable code? Right. Um, so I think in the open public app store, that there's actually a mechanism for fetching code from a repository, downloading it, and installing it. So I think that answers the question. It could be a software as a service, or it can be code that you download. So is there a place planned where people can add apps to sell them? So the way that this is constructed is that there could be many places for that. One place will be the open public app store. Another place will be the subhub app store. If Drupal Gardens moves to this model, then you would have a Drupal Gardens marketplace app store that you would be able to plug into. And that's everybody on stage has the intention for making that place. And what we're saying is we see value in making the mechanism for how to get into those places the same so that we're not, you know, creating those three different forms of video cassette that I showed earlier and like creating competing standards that make it harder to integrate. I mean Google faces the same problem. Look at how hard it was and still is for people to write um, Android apps for the Android phones just because the platform kept changing so much every time. Good. Next question. You, sir. Oh, so that's a really great point that we didn't address, and that is uh, the question was, how, basically, how do you curate the offering? So that falls, and that's a really important point, but the beauty, beauty of the um, standard is that it doesn't address it. Okay, right? That's going to be addressed by the individual app store curators who run it. And I'm sure at that point, the process for getting an app into Drupal Gardens um, and having it curated will be different than getting it into Subhub, et cetera. And that's up to the respective maintainers of the app marketplaces themselves to be the curators for those marketplaces. And all of the technical mechanism could be the same in all cases. The uh, business terms and actual curation process will most likely be divergent. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, doesn't this make it more difficult to find the right app for your business if you have to go to all these marketplaces? Our hope is that you could find the same apps in all three. So that if you download Angry Birds, you know you're going to be able to play Angry Birds, whether it's an iPhone or an Android.
So the question is, doesn't having an open app standard seed differentiation in the various products? And to an extent it does, but the, uh, the growing the size of the marketplace is far more urgent to us. None of us are big. Aqua is not big. Phase 2 is not big. Okay, the Drupal market's not even as big as we need it to be to really have a long future. We need to really be concerned much more about how big the Drupal marketplace is and how dominant it is in the uh, web content management sphere. We, we, that's far more pressing for us to solve than whether we're beating each other over the heads. Yes. Yeah, so what apps do you guys have, Evan? Oh, sorry. The question was concrete examples of apps. So uh, Evan is running an app store. What's in it? Um, well, we have apps like MailChimp, which has been cited a lot as an example. Um, Discuss is another one, so adding commenting to um, your web pages. Um, there's a Google search app to, um, Google Analytics app, sorry, to add analytics to your, your site. So again, in our case, it's really just um, a way of giving people more control over what they add and how they configure their site by um, choosing these different apps. So those are some examples of third parties, and in a few of those, in a few of those cases, we've worked directly with those companies to um, get the app built and to get it um, integrated properly. And Karen, what apps do you have in yours? Um, we have an ideation app that creates a, a place for uh, constituents of a government website to uh, add ideas for what they want to see in their world and then vote them up and down. And then an app called Project Mapper that utilizes Development Seed's Mapbox technology um, to map the projects um, of an organization or of an entity so you can um, show a map of all of your offices or all of your um, or all of your projects around the world for an organization. Um, again, a, a good way to think about an app is solving a very specific problem for a very specific audience. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's, the, that's, that's what makes a good app, is something that solves one thing, solves it well, solves it completely. And these are also examples, concrete examples, that um, are integration points for a marketplace. The Aquia network doesn't yet use the uh, open app standard. Maybe we will. Maybe our experience running it will instruct the open app standard. That's yet to be seen. We've been working on it for a long time. It's already launched. But in any case, the fundamental goal is going to be the same. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So th the question is, how, how does licensing fit into all of this? So it's an interesting question because uh, there's just like Dries had in his keynote, a uh, yin yang sign showing the conflict, conflict between easy to use and flexibility. We have a conflict between um, the benefits op of open source, which we're all well versed in, you know, more eyeballs on the cord, more people able to do it, you can customize it. Um, it's got a, a kind of almost an infectious license so that if I distribute code that I've based on GPL code, it has to be GPL. That holds true. So the apps in Karen's app store are all GPL. They're all hosted on Drupal.org. You can download them there. It's just a matter of, in this case, a convenience and usability that you can actually find them and install them from within your website experience. And since they're curated, you know what you're getting. You have guarantees about the provenance and source of that code, and there are a lot of value adds. So there's no change in uh, when you distribute code. There's no change in the licensing. That's impossible for us legally. We've got our hands tied. We can't escape the gravity of the GPL, nor would we want to. So in the cases where your model is to distribute GPL code, you have to find a way to monetize around that. And that could include support contracts. That can include customization. That inc can include web services that call out to external services that run code that you don't distribute, like Malum. Malum has a co component that's a GPL module and a bunch of servers that run a secret sauce algorithm that protect your website. Did that answer your question? 
It's a very important question, and it was one of the fundamental ones. Ben, last question. Sure, I can answer that question. So Ben's first question was, do we have a uh, preconceived notion of the price ranges of different apps? And the second question was, and how will that revenue be split? So this is a really easy question to answer because it once again depends on which app store you're trying to get it into. Okay, are you trying to get it into phase two's app store? Then we'll talk to them, okay? Trying to get into Acquia's marketplace? to them, different business arrangements. Uh, um, I don't think, you know, I don't think I can answer that question. I don't think we have time to go through that, but I, I know that, for example, a lot of the web services that um, Acquia would like to offer will range from, you know, free, you get them as part of the network when you subscribe to it, like most of the ones we have now. Or possibly in the future, the value add is so great that we don't have a freemium model for it, or there's an upsell from a freemium model where you then would pay something usually predicated on the external provider's pricing more to get that premium service. An example for that is Mobify. Uh, the Mobifies that you get when you subscribe to the Acquia network, you don't pay any extra for that. You just pay the subscription price, and you get something that is a tick above their freemium offering. So you actually get better analytics and uh, statistics from your Mobify experience than if you went to them directly. But if you want the full deal for Mobify with all of their tools that they offer, then you pay them 250 a month. So that's already a different price point than your $5 example. So, and I, I've seen other services, you know, think Salesforce. What do you pay for Salesforce, right? What if Salesforce were in one of these marketplaces? Hypothetical, we don't have plans for that. I'm just saying that there are price points out there that are interesting for the running of a Drupal site that are way beyond $5. And the eventual splitting of that revenue will definitely depend on which partner you're talking to. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Um, we'll be around for more questions afterwards, and thank you to my guests for sharing the stage.